just to give a, a brief intro and a brief overview, um, the reason for this particular webinar um, is to, to bring an understanding of how Utah took the outdoor industry as one of their main economic industry uh, uh, focuses and turned this into one of their main economic development uh, forces in the state. And from this, when they when Utah did this in 2014, how this turned into a catalyst to have other states create entities or focus their economy similarly to how the state of Utah did. And this has created a whole new uh, sector of the economic sector, uh, the economic industry for the United States and has presented the outdoor industry as one of the top economic sectors for the, for the United States. Um, and we want to understand how that has also helped not only from an economic standpoint, but also a healthcare standpoint um, and other industries that are involved around it from a manufacturing standpoint, which we're going to be uh, listening with Andrew. He's visited Puerto Rico. He, he's been very gracious to, to visit some of the local universities and, and bring a, a great insight to the students and, and has a, an idea of how we can use this as a means to to bring more industry to the island and use the, the outdoor industry, not just from the perspective of us going outside and enjoying what we love to do, but also how can we create local jobs and turn this into a, a economic development tool for Puerto Rico. Um, and also we want to, to present through what Pitt is going to be bringing as well and, and uh, Manuel Lavoy, how we will be able to, to use this to further develop the industry locally and how we will be able to create mapping of what we have currently and how that could be extended um, so we can have a more precise and concise understanding of what we have a uh, locally to offer and how we can expand this to better serve p local uh, uh, the local economy and also people that are visiting Puerto Rico once we go through this process of recovery from COVID. But we do have a lot of uh, uh, activities and attractions and natural resources that, that make Puerto Rico a very uh, unique place uh, within the United States and within the Caribbean region and Latin America as well to, pr to present itself to more growth within this sector. Um, and that's just a brief overview of, of the reasoning behind why we've been collaborating with the state of Utah for some time now and with, with Andrew and the University of Utah. And uh, with that, I, I leave it with a uh, with Pitt, who's going to, for, for, he's a director of the, uh, the, out, uh, the Office of the outdoor, uh, outdoor Recreation Industry in Utah, and he's presenting uh, us with, with a great uh, topic on how Utah has taken this uh, as, as a means for economic development and talking a little bit more in depth of what I was just talking about. Great. Thank you, Carlos. Appreciate it. Hi, welcome, everybody. Um, happy to be here and, and excited to talk to you all. My name is Pitt Gruy. I am the director of the Office of Outdoor Recreation for the state of Utah. I am going to share my screen here so I can show you some slides. Visit and live in Utah due to our recreation opportunities. I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with Utah or have been to Utah, but you know, in the, in, in the northern part of the state, we have high mountains, alpine, snow, the best skiing in the world, everything else. As you move down south through the state, we turn into this desert paradise of red rocks and arches and canyonlands and Zion National Park um, and, and locations like that that you can explore. And, and um, you know, we have an amazing amount of public lands, over 34 um, million acres of public lands that people can access and use and, and recreate on. So it's a really fantastic amenity that, that the state of Utah has and can take advantage of. And so with, with all of that, the, uh, the governor's office recognized that, you know, forming this Office of Outdoor Recreation in the Office of Economic Development can, you know, is a, is a good idea and, and, a, and a good strategy to help grow the state um, moving forward. So... Uh, I want to talk a little bit what the purpose of the Office of Outdoor Recreation is. So, you know, overall, we have a couple of goals, but here our main points are basically to improve the quality of life for every Utah through recreation. So whether that's health, for health reasons, for, for satisfaction, for 
just overall being able to get outside. And we all know that makes us happy, especially during these times of uh, recovering from COVID, you know, sometimes outdoor recreation and, and being outside is the only thing that's kept us sane and, and, and happy. Um, so that is, that, that is the primary goal to improve the quality of life for every Utah. Um, second, we support access and proper use of our public lands. Like I said, with the, with, you know, 34 million acres of public lands, um, we needed to make sure we were good stewards and, and caretakers of that land, that, that it's being used properly, that we also provide access to people to use it. And, um, and, and you know, these are lands that are owned by everybody to access and to use and, and making sure that that's done responsibly is, is key. And then lastly, it's to strengthen the outdoor industry economy in Utah. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but, uh, you know, we have a lot of companies and manufacturers and jobs and retailers that come to the state through because of the outdoor industry economy. All right, so Utah outdoor recreation economy, just to give you some numbers, it contributes to more than 12.3 billion to, to the state economy. So this is in combination with tourism reasons and, and why people are visiting, but you know, with that, you know, a lot of people come to Utah for the outdoor adventure uh, aspect. A lot of adventure travelers, a lot of people coming to see our national parks, our state parks, everything else. Um, so it contributes to more than 12.3 billion in the economy. It employs more than 110,000 people um, and, is the, and is kind of the primary driver behind the tourism industry, like I said. Um, they create $737 million in state and local tax revenues. Um, so people that are recreating in the state or work in the recreation economy in the state, um, you know, are contributing to this uh, $3.9 billion in wages and salaries. So you can see why it was important for the governor's office and the state to establish an office that's supportive of this to represent this and, and to, to move things forward. You can see that it is no small uh, economic driver in the state of Utah. 3.3 of the state um, GDP is attributed to outdoor recreation. So the other part of it is not only, you know, those are the kind of the direct effects of, of it to the state. The secondary economic effects are what people, or what, I guess, additional causes from the great recreation resources and development that we have. So outdoor recreation resources stimulate growth in other business sectors. Utah has seen, is, is, is been rated one of the fastest growing states in the country um, and rated one of the most business friendly states eight years in a row by Forbes magazine. Um, so, you know, a lot of businesses are looking to Utah to relocate because of our business friendly policies and, and, you know, tax, tax policies and, and everything else that, that, that business owners want to see and, and take advantage of. But on top of that, they use the outdoor industry or the outdoor recreation industry heavily to recruit these companies as well, because they say, look, you can come out and you can, your, your employees are going to love it because they have access to trails right out their back door. They have access to rivers and lakes and, and, uh, and fishing and hunting and all of these things that, that really help draw people to the state um, to, to, to relocate to Utah and to, you know, set up, you know, set up their homes and their families and, and everything else here. Outdoor recreation is regularly used to showcase the quality of life in, in Utah. 35% of businesses say that access to outdoor recreation plays a major role and then being able to acquire and retain employees here in Utah. Um, you know, the, the tech industry has been a really big growth sector in Utah. So whether that is software companies, uh, people, a lot of companies uh, in Silicon Valley in California are setting up second offices here in Utah. Um, again, because of their ability to retain employees and recruit new employees to come work here and, and keep them you know, because of the quality of life here in Utah and, and, and access, access to outdoor recreation. 18% of, of these companies in, in, in all these sectors say that outdoor recreation is a primary reason of why they are located in Utah. So not even just for recruiting staff, but the business owners, the CEOs, the board members, 
they all want to be in Utah as well. And so, you know, they look at, they, they, they want to be able to ride their bike and, and go on hikes and take their families, you know, camping and, and everything else. And, you know, that definitely plays into their decisions of, of why to locate their business here in Utah. So um, talking a little bit more about the uh, outdoor industry uh, here in Utah, we have over 250 recreation-based businesses here in Utah and, and industry-based in, in Utah. So this includes uh, outdoor retailer uh, shops, you know, bike shops, ski shops, everything else, um, manufacturers. Uh, we, have, we have a handful of ski manufacturers that are built here in, in Utah and have their factories. We have a handful of bike parts and, and bike manufacturers, um, you know, distributors as well. So a lot of companies that maybe are European based or um, you know, internationally based, they set up their North American distribution and offices here in, in Utah. And then of course we have outfitters and guides um, that come here to take advantage of the access to the public lands and, and to, to guide people on, on adventures and, and outdoor recreation. Um, and again, another reason for this and how we do this is the business, business friendly policies that, that our, our state government has, has set up, whether that's incentives, tax incentives, whether that's grant programs for bringing jobs to rural Utah and to smaller communities. Um, all of these are, are really, smiled upon and, and looked to as, as advantages to get small businesses and, and other businesses to move here. Um, we have a really valuable workforce and talent pool. So um, in the outdoor industry, for example, I, I have worked in the outdoor industry for about 15 years. Uh, I worked in the ski industry at, at ski resorts. I worked for uh, in sales and marketing for a couple of larger brands like Goal Zero and Petzl um, and a smaller brand named Bivy.com. All of these um, are here, you know, right in, in driving distance of my home. So if you can see, we have a, a bunch of other large companies, you know, Black Diamond, Specialized Bikes. A lot of them have offices here. And because of that, it brings talent pools and, and career professionals in the outdoor industry to Utah. And, and, and you know, they're able to find good jobs and, and progress their career by, you know, if, it, if an opportunity comes up at a different company without having to transplant themselves or their whole family to another state or, or move across the country for, for a job. So, you know, we have really valuable workforce that wants to stay here in Utah and find the jobs here in Utah with the companies that are here. Um, and then of course, you know, retainment uh, and, and career satisfaction due to recreational access is, is a big point. People will stay in Utah for the fact that they have access to outdoor recreation opportunities, you know, regardless of what job, you know, we, we hear it over and over again where people will say, well, I was offered a job in New York City and it was a great job, but I just couldn't leave Utah because I want to ski. I just couldn't leave Utah because I want to be able to ride my bike in the morning before I go into work or, or I want to be able to go fishing on the weekends easily close to my home or, you know people make those decisions based off of the, the infrastructure and the amenities and the opportunities that we have here in Utah. They'll pass up a, a potential move or a potential different career just because of the access to outdoor recreation. A um, couple more uh, uh, things. So what, how does this affect rural Utah? You know, um, again, in Utah, most of our population lives in the Salt Lake area, what we call the Wasatch Front. So, um, most of, you know, I think we, we have about just over 3 million people in Utah um, and 2 million of them basically live in the Salt Lake City, you know, Wasatch Front area. Um, so, you know, a third people live in smaller communities around the state. Um, and, and that's what we refer to as rural Utah. So, you know, for example, Moab is one of our premier destinations for mountain bikers and rock climbing and, and, and kayaking and rafting and, and all these things. Uh, it, plus it's a gateway community to two national parks. You know, it's, it's something that has, has really boomed and Moab has really grown from this small little ranching and mining community, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago to what is now a 
huge destination hub and brings in millions and millions of visitors a year. So uh, the value, one of the most popular trails in Moab is called the Slick Rock Trail. And maybe some of you have ridden that or heard about it, but it's a, it's a gorgeous mountain bike trail um, over you know, the Red Rocks and the Slick Rock, um, really unique experience. It, for years and years and years, it was the you know, most popular trail in the West and people would travel from all over. They, you know, Moab estimated that that trail alone with the amount of visitors that come in to ride that trail generates $9 million in, in revenue to businesses, um, whether that's to bike shops, to restaurants, to hotels, any just for people that are specifically in Moab to ride that trail. Um, back in the day, it was kind of one of the only trails, you know, that had been developed and, and got a lot of popularity. Now, Moab has hundreds, hundreds of miles of trails surrounding their community, you know, and so I think just one, one trail can drive $9 million a year now with hundreds of miles of trail, how, how much revenue that brings into their community. And that's just for mountain bikers. Um, so, you know, just a, a fantastic to see what, what outdoor recreation can do to drive people to, into these smaller communities. From 1990 to 2015, hotel rooms grew from 600 to over 1,800 in Moab. Um, so, you know, Moab just boomed with visitors and, and the ability to accept visitors. 2018, there was an increase in visitors. Um, to, there was a 20% increase in, in visitors to recreation-based areas in the state, totaling more than 20 million visits to, to natural areas. Um, so whether that's national parks, state parks, um, you know, forest service land, all of these things, um, you know, a 20% increase with over 20 million visitors in the state going to visit these sites in Utah just for recreational opportunities. These natural places, these places, you know, not going to come to go to, to basketball games or to, um, you know, see the city and, and, and experience that. These are people going to rural areas, you know, out in the middle of nowhere where they can ride their bikes or, or their four wheelers or anything else. Um, so how do we support that here in our office? Uh, and I think that's kind of the important thing. It doesn't just happen magically that people show up and you're able to handle that. You have to be proactive in, in creating the, the structure and the support to make sure that it grows sustainably and not out of control and that the land isn't damaged or, you know, taken, taken advantage of. So um, what we do is we have a grant program at our office that we administer. So we get funds from the tourism world, um, you know, basically a tax that is our, our hotel tax. Uh, uh, we call it the TRT. The ho hotel tax, we get a small percentage of that every year. For every visitor that stays in a hotel in Utah, we get a small percentage, and that money goes to supporting a grant that is used for outdoor recreation infrastructure. So this is for trail building and maintenance, to building visitor centers, to river restoration and cleanup or access and, and, and boat ramps and docks and lakes and anything where people use it for outdoor recreation, that's where we, that's where we support um, with our grant. So the UORG grant program um, has been around for about five years. And from 2015 to 2020, we've distributed over $16 million um, to projects with values over 121 million. So these are match grants. We, we require that um, any project that we support that they have a match com component from the, com from the community. So, you know, a lot of the times we, we fund a, a small city or a small county here in Utah, we'll give them some money and then they use some of their budget and then they can build a new mountain bike trail project or, or, or complex. They can build, uh, uh, cross country skiing, you know, uh, zone with signage and, and trails and, and everything that they need. Um, but, you know, we, like I said, we've, we've put $16 million from our budget, uh, uh, into this, uh, but the total value is 120 million in projects that we've supported in, in infrastructure across the state. That's 213 projects that we've awarded in the five years. Um, 61% of these projects fund in rural Utah. So we all know the communities, the smaller communities have a harder time coming up with funding and budget to, 
to build a trail system or to build any kind of infrastructure. Um, so we really focus on giving the majority uh, to these rural communities, um, as well as providing for different types of user groups. It's not just trails for mountain biking. It's not, you know, or not just um, uh, boat ramps for kayakers and canoers and, and things like that. We really try to focus on anything from ATV uh, to fishing and hunting to all types of outdoor recreation because we have such a large user base of, of all different types of activities here. So we, we have built over, you know, with these grants, they've built over 300 miles of new trails. So, um, you know, you can see the effects here in the state of Utah just by establishing the, the Office of Outdoor Recreation and kind of putting together the program um, where it's beneficial to, uh, to support the infrastructure and the kind of sustainable growth um, in the state. So um, our goal has always been to focus on the quality of life in Utah first for our residents and for people moving in um, and, um, through outdoor recreation, but that brings business, it brings more visitors and a strong workforce and a strong economy just as a, as a side effect. So our legislature and our, our state leaders are really supportive of this and, and, and we're very lucky. Kind of to talk about what Carlos mentioned earlier, we were the first Office of Outdoor Recreation established in 2013. Since then, 14 other states have established uh, Office of Outdoor Recreation with I think four or five more states that are in, in the process of uh, creating uh, you know, commissions or committees to help support it within, the, within their government, governor's offices and also uh, hopefully you know, kind of gateways into creating full offices of outdoor recreation. So it, you know, I, I commend Utah for being at the forefront of, of, the, uh, of this process and of creating these offices. It's really fantastic to see other states jumping on and support it. And now we have a great network of states that we meet, you know, right after this call, actually, I will be on a phone call with the confluence of states as we call them, which is the, um, all the other states of outdoor recreation. So, um, you know, and we talk about what's going on in the world and, and how we recover from COVID and we, how, how to move forward. I, um, I do want to say one more thing. Um, the, with this office being created, it's, it's given a great opportunity for Utah, you know, to prioritize outdoor recreation. And because of that, as we are looking now of how we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and how do we stimulate the economy again and get people visiting, because obviously Utah has been hit very hard with our tourism industry where we'd normally, this would be our busy season with visitors coming to our national parks and, our, and, and to recreate and everything else. You know, we definitely aren't seeing that as, as much as we normally would. But our, our leaders in the state are so adamant about outdoor recreation and, and the importance of it that as we look at ways to stimulate the economy, there is a lot of talk around putting more money into outdoor recreation infrastructure now because of the long-term investment that, that it, and the value that it brings, you know. Not only does it get people back to work, if we start building trails and, and, and trailheads and restrooms and things like that, not only does it get people back to work really quick that may have lost their jobs, um, but in the long run, those are gonna pay off because the visitors are gonna come and use that and having that infrastructure there brings a lot of value as opposed to trying to catch up you know, after we get the people coming back and then trying to figure out, well, what do we do with all these crowds and how do we deal with them and, and how do we deal with these visitors? So. You know, it's very interesting to see the proactive thinking and the value of investing in outdoor recreation first, which then brings the increase in the, in the economy as opposed to investing in getting people here and then, and then trying to retroactively you know, invest in outdoor recreation. So I commend Utah for that and it's really fantastic and hopefully we can continue to, to move forward with that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has or or, you know, uh, as, as we move forward here, you can always reach out to my office here in the state of Utah and, and we can help to answer any questions. We're here as a support network 
for any anybody that's thinking about how to increase and improve outdoor recreation in their area, we want to we want to be a part of that and, and help out. So we're going to leave the Q and A till the end because uh, Secretary Laboy hasn't been able to join us. But I do have two quick follow up questions that pertain directly to what the last two comments that you you mentioned. Um, and I wanted to to gauge what do you what do you think are like the you know two to three biggest challenges for a territory or a state that's trying to create a new economic uh, uh, strategy focused on the outdoor economy. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of the, a couple of the challenges and, and we've seen in other states as well is, you know, where, where does this live, right? Where does this office live? For us, we're lucky enough that it is under the Office of Economic Development. I think that's the right play. We've seen it in other states get thrown under forestry and wildland offices. We've seen it under parks and recreation offices. And, um, you know, I, each state is a little bit different in, in how they run and, and what needs to be done. But, you know, for for, in my opinion, the, the Office of Outdoor Recreation under the Office of Economic Development is really beneficial because they, they coincide, at least for us, it coincides so well with tourism, it coincides so well with visitors, and like I said, the big point of how many businesses use Utah's outdoor recreation as a recruiting tool to bring yeah. employees in, it just makes so much sense. So. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a challenge, finding out where the fit is uh, and, and how to kind of get the support network around it to be successful. Because we've, we've fallen in that economic development side, we really have had a great support network um, with, the, with our, kind of our sister agencies and, and, the, and the other departments that we work with. Um, if you're kind of left, if you're just developed as your own office and your own department, you know, you're kind of you're kind of on your own and that, and that's hard and that's difficult. That's an uphill battle for sure. So um, the other thing is finding the money, you know, finding the money to create these, you know, we use tourism dollars and, and that tax, you know, other States use a lottery in lottery dollars or, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, for legislature and it's hard for leaders of a, of a territory or a state to, to all of a sudden say, okay, we're going to give, you know, millions of dollars to this new office to go do things with that. That's hard. And so um, you know, finding the dollars is hard, but, you know, I think like I said, by, by tying it to economic development, by tying it to tourism, I think that helps to make it a success. And then you're able to use, you know, I, there, there's kind of direct relation. If tourism's great, we have more money in our grant fund. If tourism is slow, we don't. And, you know, then it's a little bit of incentive for our office to get to get moving and, and help support tourism and help support that as much as we can. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to do a little bit more Q&A um, in a couple of minutes once once Andrew and, and uh, Secretary Lavoy uh, do our presentations and Carlos. Um, so we'll we'll switch to to Q&A at the end. I just wanted to take a quick second to to present Carlos Betancourt, who's the, the Dean of the School of Architecture of the Polytechnic University. They didn't notice he was in at the beginning of the, of the meeting. So I just wanna to welcome him and, and say thank you for all the support that he has provided and the university have provided Peria. So it's a, a great honor to have you here as well. Um, I don't know, um, no, yeah, I just wanted to, to say that and also everyone else that, that has joined us, uh, thanks for joining us in, in this great, uh, event that we're having today. Um, with that, we're going to move now to, to Andrew DeSelster from the, he's, he's the director for the outdoor product design and development program for the Utah State University. Um, he's, a, like I mentioned before, a, a great person who, who's graced us with visiting Puerto Rico before and providing a lot of feedback and, and uh, great input to how we could um, develop more programs for whether it's design and, and university or help us also develop the, the more manufacturing side of, of, of the industry um, that supports the, the, um, the, uh, the industry as well. So um, with that, yeah, I just want to leave it with Andrew so, so that he can uh, yeah, give us his presentation and, and we're, we're going to continue with our agenda where we're uh, with on, uh, secretary Lavoy, Carlos Elise, and also, 
uh, the dean of, of the University of, of uh, Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico. Yeah, so I was going to kind of talk about the kind of collaboration that the state of Utah has with the university here at Utah State and then even just a couple of the others and kind of the impact that that's had on the state economy uh, and the workforce. And so just kind of looking at it, um, the outdoor industry, as, as Pitt has said, is quite large here in the, in the state. A lot of outdoor recreationalists like to get out there, rock climb, mountain bike, do it all. And uh, so Utah State, about five years ago, realized that, you know, maybe we need to start training uh, workers specifically for these types of roles in the outdoor industry. And so at least our program uh, in outdoor product design and development uh, was started then. Uh, another university in Ogden, Utah, a year or two later, put out uh, another one more in the commerce area of the outdoor industry. Um, the University of Utah has one in tourism. And so several of the universities now just within the state have specific degrees kind of tailored to uh, the outdoors, whether it's on the tourism side, the design side, manufacturing side. Um, and so the state has been really good to support that. And so looking just specifically here at Utah State, um, there's a lot of uh, educational initiatives. The state of Utah really pushes for a very strong, well-educated workforce um, to meet the demands for tomorrow. And so one of the benefits um, that we were able to uh, write some grants for and were awarded a strategic workforce initiative, which is a uh, uh, kind of a grant system that comes out each year from the state and that's how to build the next level of workforce. And so we were able to get that and it allowed us to hire more faculty, uh, help supply some materials for the labs so the students could get that hands-on experience. And so that's been a huge benefit as we've been growing. When the program started in 2015, 20, yeah, 2015 initially we had we had hoped to have about 20 students in the program by the end of the first year. By the end of the first week, there's about 60. And by the end of the first month, there's about 80 kids in the program. And we now currently sit at about 253 students, I think last time I checked a couple weeks ago, in our program. And to be able to service that many students and help them uh, through their education, we needed those extra resources. And so the state saw that need they, it was backed up by our local industry saying, we need these designers, we need these, uh, we need these workers that can help us out. And so they were able to award us those types of grants. So that's one way the uni university and the state are able to collaborate. Um, similarly, we have other ones called like talent ready grants that uh, are able to come in and, and give us extra funding that we're able to produce new equipment so we could train them on more of the latest and greatest or the, the types of equipment that they would need to know how to use and or run out in industry, um, whether that's for design, manufacturing. And so it's just another great way to, that the state has helped support the education system for that outdoor industry. And so a lot of these grants are also awarded to other universities each year um, and they just make a great contribution. Um, and even then at the state level, we're even able to do um, economic development grants. And so these are ones where we work directly with industry. And so I've been working on one this last year. And so we're able to take and track our students as they graduate, go to industry, or even as they're still in school, work on um, new projects with local industry. Um, and as an example, we have one, she was a, a junior uh, but industry couldn't wait. She was really good uh, in the textiles industry. So she's a really good designer, really knew her way around a sewing machine and uh, all the different processes. And so she was recruited out at the end of her junior year, um, came into one company, worked for them for about a year, is now working with another company that she's come into and completely revamped the way they do their processing. And so she was able to help bring them up, even though it was a fairly good sized company, well established, they still had a lot of learning curves that the students able to come in and help bolster their, their uh, company up and help bring even more profits to it. 
and help drive more economic development. And so looking at some of these impacts from these types of projects, we, we tracked it over uh, whether these were um, from students entering uh, internships that students spent with companies working or even just we'll do a lot of design challenges here on campus where companies will come in and students can help produce ideas for the, the local industry so they know what they're doing. And uh, this last year alone, we tracked about $12 million in impact on businesses. And that's through the creation of either new products, um, improving existing processes, or uh, even helping to spin out new, uh, new companies. So a couple of our graduates uh, develop products while in school. And then upon graduating, they basically kick off their, uh, their new companies. Some of the seed money comes from the university. So we'll have a lot of design competitions, especially out of our entrepreneurial center, uh, which receives some state funding as well. And so that helps kick out some of these new businesses. Cause really at the end of the day, the university's goal is to try to get people educated and trained to move into industry. But at the same time, we wanna see more growth of industry. So a lot of these students that are very passionate about the outdoors have great ideas uh, will actually develop their own products and start spinning out their own brands. And so we've actually had a few new companies start um, from, the, from the program. Um, and even as part of these other grants that the, the state uh, gives to the university, a lot of the benefit with these projects that we do do, um, we'll have uh, a company come to us or we'll collaborate together on a new product, which will require an entire new manufacturing line um, and so we then help set that up with our manufacturing extension partnerships uh, that we have. And uh, so that brings new manufacturing then to the state. Uh, so we can bring in even more workers uh, and add to the economic health of the state. And so we're able to, we're able to do quite a bit on that educational level um, as we train students for, like I said, these, these next jobs. And so a lot, of, a lot of where that need comes from is from our tourism industry and from a lot of the people here in the state that do love to recreate. And so a lot of them will, will kind of try to figure out how, how to start their own company in their off time. Um, as an example, we had uh, a composites manufacturer that was doing some aerospace stuff, really like mountain biking. So he said, uh, there's gotta be a way to turn these into mountain bike rims and make super light wheel sets. And uh, so trial after trial, slowly figured it out. And then with the help of you know, some of the engineers coming from the universities and some of the manufacturing technicians, they put together now um, a great uh, composite uh, facility that produces a lot of mountain bike parts, um, road bike parts, things like that, that are just coming right out that um, that just was homegrown based off some love for the outdoors. And so we're able to see that economic growth, uh, both from the university's side of things and also from just the people, like I said, that are here or even the ones that are here that have great ideas and don't know what to do. There's a lot of good resources that the state of Utah has put together um, to help these people uh, kind of start to grow and improve the economic segment here in the state. Um, part of the other, the other big thing that I kind of wanted to talk on was um, a lot of the kind of supply chain and, and manufacturing. You kind of look at um, a lot of what we have here in the state and a lot of the hard product will get manufactured locally. Um, but a lot of our soft goods, so your tents, sleeping bags, your clothes, your things like that, um, are going to be outsourced. And uh, we've all seen lately, especially with the, the pandemic, the effect that that's had when China closed down first, and then a lot of Indonesia or uh, the Pacific Rim countries have, have shut down, and what that's done to the supply chain of trying to actually get product in, um, and the big push for a lot of a lot of uh, politicians to get companies to pull their manufacturing from China and over there and try to bring it back. And I think this is where um, areas like Puerto Rico could stand to benefit where you've got a strong textile uh, manufacturing 
uh, area. There are a couple really good facilities there uh, where a lot of the states don't necessarily have uh, strong textile local manufacturing. We do, we do some here in the state of Utah, but nothing on uh, mass quantities, a lot of more prototyping, uh, mom and pop shops. And so having those facilities um, that you can then expand out and help grow with new um, types of products or new industries uh, really is beneficial for growing that. And so as an example, we had um, one brand here in the state produces goggles and uh, they've been producing goggles this whole time all through COVID because their supply chain was all local and they didn't rely on uh, needing those imports from Asia. And so I think that Puerto Rico could really stand to benefit from trying to market some of the, the natural manufacturing and resources that they have um, as companies are now starting to look uh, elsewhere for potential manufacturing plus a lot of the tax incentives that, that companies could have by relocating their manufacturing uh, to the island. Um, not to mention, whenever I talk to our designers and our developers that have to go to Asia all the time, they hate it. And uh, after my recent visit to Puerto Rico last summer, I'm like, I would come here in a heartbeat every time. Like, just send me over, I need to go check on something. Um, plus it's much more affordable for uh, companies here in the States to, to fly people down to Puerto Rico. And I think it's in a great position for the Caribbean and Latin America for headquarters of types of companies. Um, but that supply chain, like I said, becomes super critical. And that's what we've found kind of is the linchpin in, in the manufacturing process is as soon as your supply chain is disrupted, all of a sudden your company's on hold, nothing can get out. And I think potentially the more that we can keep that local, uh, the better off the, uh, a lot of the companies here in Utah and even around the, the rest of the states would benefit from that. Um, and so again, it it's just comes back to kind of educating the, the companies on those benefits and then having a, a well-trained uh, and ready workforce that can come into these types of manufacturing um, and help set up shop or help uh, just streamline a lot of the processing, um, which can be a huge benefit. Um, and then one of the other big things, especially in the outdoor industry, is the sustainable manufacturing processes, uh, which has been really hard for a lot of Asian countries to, to grasp or to, to tackle just due to their economic situations or their kind of uh, environmental protection uh, type policies. And so I think that this is also another area that uh, could be accelerated in both in Utah and in Puerto Rico um, to really bring about a good sustainable model for uh, manufacturing and even design. Because when we look at a lot of product, it really all the waste is in the upfront so it's in the development of the natural resource, whether that's industry, agriculture, mining extraction, uh, then producing the dyes or producing the um, finishes for the materials. And so that's where about 80 to 90% of all the waste occurs is right there in the front end. And then the last little bit obviously is the end of the life of the product. Um, but being able to really tout a more sustainable approach and people being able to see it um, becomes pretty important, especially where, like I said, getting over to Asia, one becomes a very time consuming and can be quite expensive. Uh, so a lot of smaller to medium businesses have a hard time with quality control because they can't uh, send people over. They don't have somebody living over there um, to constantly monitor their facilities where I think it's going to be a lot easier of a sale to have people live in, in Puerto Rico and uh, monitor quality control or um, send people periodically. Uh, and then with all these sustainable, sustainable manufacturing uh, certificates and um, certifications, 
it becomes a lot easier for companies to double check those when travel's a lot less restricted and uh, language barriers aren't as big a problem. Um, and so this idea of being able to then maybe push the segment of sustainable manufacturing is a big push. Uh, might draw a lot more um, manufacturing uh, to the island. Um, we've seen it with a lot of uh, brands now like REI is pushing out that you need to meet these new standards uh, or we won't sell your products in our stores. And so a lot of companies are scrambling to like, well, how do, where do I find a manufacturer who can do these things for me? Or where can I do this or that? Or how am I supposed to um, make sure this is actually happening? And so, like I said, that's where um, working in the outdoor industry, you already got the tourism side and then you can now tack on the design and manufacturing side that would help really benefit and draw those businesses in um, as, you, as you start to look to grow uh, the manufacturing. And like I said, with the, the manufacturing, it also helps offset a lot of that economic um, issues with the tourism. And so we're still able to manufacture uh, so we still have some of those jobs while we're waiting for everything to reopen. And so that's kind of helped out uh, quite a bit with helping people to retain a lot of that work. But at the end of the day, when we look at it, we look at the outdoor industry, what do you need? You need your apparel, you need your footwear, you need your uh, soft products, you need your hard products. And so the state of Utah really works hard with the, the different universities to make sure that we've got a workforce that's trained to, to help design, help make, help manufacture, and then also to help uh, then use those products. So I think just about every university in our state has a uh, outdoor recreation degree where you can learn to be those guys, you can learn how to, to host and do the tourism side of it. And so it's just a really good um, collaboration, like I said, between our our, uh, our state, our economic development offices, and then the universities to, to really just help bolster that outdoor uh, industry here in the state. And so that's kind of my main talking points that I wanted to address was really that, again, the, the collaboration between universities and the state need to exist. There needs to be um, some funding mechanisms because that investment that the state makes in the universities comes right back to them in, in uh, taxes and ideally new, new businesses and, and wages and creates just great jobs for the local, local people. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Like, like we've talked about before and in, in, in other forums that, you know, we, we believe that the programs that, that you've started and everything you're doing is, is what's going to bring the outdoor economy to the next level, not just the enjoyment of the outdoor environment, but also how does that become an, eco an economic stimulus for jobs and, and other things that, that are associated to, to expanding the, the, the growth of the economy, not just from, from a, an enjoyment standpoint, but also bringing more, more to, to the territories and, and, and to, the, to the places where the programs are being developed and also creating those future minds that can start companies like what your, your program has done um, with the implementation of these grants and, and, and bringing, you know, the creative aspects and, and business aspects out of these students. Yeah. So, so with that, I wanted to, to give Dean uh, Betancourt uh, a chance to say hi, since, since we didn't do that before. Sorry about that, Carlos. Um, and I think it brings a, a great moment also a, uh, Andrew was here last year, last summer, collaborating with, with the Department of Industrial Design at the uh, Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico. And it's been a year. And, and uh, in addition to, to saying hi to us, uh, Dean Betancourt, I wanted to, to get your, your insight on how this collaboration that uh, Eddie's program uh, and, and uh, the, uh, Andrew's visit has had on your program and, and how you see it evolving into a future within the university. So good morning and, and thanks for being here with us. Morning. Uh, thank you for sharing all with us this opportunity. And uh, 
I'm, in, in behalf of the university and the president, Ernesto Vasquez Barquet, we're pleased to be sharing this uh, opportunity with, with you guys. Um, I, I'm pretty um, sure that this initiative will provide for future um, students that will be interested in going to our associate degree. And Eddie is, is, is an incredible guy and he's very creative and he's very productive. And so we're doing quite well. I think that the, the, the best thing that happens with this is that the people see how other discipline um, get in, engaged and multi interdisciplinary approaches. So I think that's the most important thing. And, and we know people and, and talk to other ones. So thank you for, for being here with us. And, you know, keep, don't take so long to do those, this in, in incentive at the, as part of our uh, pedagogical approach. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and also, I also want to recognize um, Secretary Laboy, um, the, he's, he's the Secretary of the Department of Economic Development and Commerce of Puerto Rico, who has joined us. Um, he has a, a very busy schedule, so we, we um, are grateful for you being able to join us. Um, and we wanted to, to take a couple minutes, uh, Secretary Laboy, if, if you wanted to, to say hi and, and um, share, share some of your thoughts. I know we've been back and forth through a team talking about the outdoor industry and how we see it as a as a possible, or you know, as as a as a means to to diversify our economic development in Puerto Rico, um, and just to to get your thoughts a couple of minutes here, if if, if you would uh, grace us with with some of your opinions. Yes, uh, thank you, and and good morning to to you and to the other keynote speakers and the rest of the participants. Uh, I want to thank the Puerto Rico Outdoor Recreational Industry Association for the invitation. Uh, eh, Carlos Soto, everybody, uh, thank you. Eh, we've been eh, somehow eh, having a conversation, uh, back and forth, uh, communication and collaboration for you know for the last you know twelve, maybe eighteen months, and so uh, in terms of how can we work together. And, and basically add the outdoor uh, industry uh, to be part of our strategy to diversify the economy of Puerto Rico and promote economic development. So um, I'm going to share a presentation uh, and this will be a, the way to guide the conversation from my side. So in a moment, hold on, here we go. Perfect, I think you can see it. And yes. let me just, here we go. Okay, so uh, essentially, uh, I think that it is important before we get into some of the specifics to give a little bit background of what is the Department of Economic Development and Commerce. Uh, the department is basically the agency that is uh, responsible to promote economic development of Puerto Rico, to promote the diversification, diversification of the economy, and to do it in a way that matches our core competencies and also uh, in a way that is integrated, holistic, and sustainable. O over the course of uh, many years, specifically over the last five years, the department has become a, an agency that is more uh, moving towards being a, a client-oriented agency, a one-stop shop agency to support all these key uh, objectives associated with our strategic plan and what we want to achieve in terms of economic development for Puerto Rico. So for example, today, the department includes programs such as workforce development, youth development, includes also uh, the, the film industry program, also includes um, the energy, uh, the public policy uh, energy program, includes also the office of, of, the, of tax incentives. Um, it also includes the office of permits of Puerto Rico. Uh, some, many people haven't realized that for the last year and a half, the permit of uh, the office uh, management permit, uh, office per, uh, permit management 
is part of the deck of our agency now. And also we uh, have the business development side of manufacturing, technology, research and development, export services, small and medium enterprises. All of that is now part of, of our scope of services and approach. And also part of the umbrella includes um, the tourism company, which is in the process of becoming the office of tourism of the DDEC. The planning board is, is ascribed to our, uh, to our agency, uh, along with the local redevelopment authority for, for the old naval base Roosevelt Roads. Additionally, of, of moving towards being a one-stop shop, we are also, a, as part of you know, being the secretary of economic development, I am the chairman of the board of very important institutions. Some of them are a private nonprofit. For example, the Puerto Rico Science Trust, Invest Puerto Rico recently created, Discover Puerto Rico, uh, not a chairman, but member of the board directors, uh, as well as being the, uh, the chairman of other agencies that all put together um, uh, basically aims at looking at economic development and economic growth again on a holistic uh, perspective. So we're in the middle of making this transition and this transformation of our agency. And the question that I will ask myself is along this process, how can we best incorporate uh, outdoor recreation, uh, not only as a strategy, but also as something that is embedded in the transformation of the agency. Uh, having said that, it's always important to look at the current profile of Puerto Rico's economy, where we are today, because it does reflect our current strength and opportunities. And at the same token, it also reflects the need to look at other sectors along with our traditional sectors and long-term partners so we can really look at Puerto Rico from the perspective of economic growth and the lens of a diversified economy. As you see, uh, these are numbers from uh, fiscal year 2019, uh, Puerto Rico is still a highly industrialized uh, island and economy. Almost 50% of our GDP or gross domestic product is based on manufacturing and two thirds of that are somehow related to the bioscience, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and medical device sectors. So we are a sophisticated economy. We are a highly industrial, industrialized economy. And despite of the fact that over the last 20 years, there's been a, a transition away from certain manufacturing ac activities that in the past um, were very, uh, you know, uh, were very fundamental to the economy of Puerto Rico. Uh, even with that, we still uh, have a, a big size manufacturing sector that represents half of the economy. And then you look at the other sectors like finance, insurance, and real estate, uh, which are you know, more of the, of the service side. Then you have uh, other services and, and, and commerce and all put together, you have basically the other sector of the economy. I can highlight uh, interesting facts that also represents opportunities in the short and medium term. The fact that agriculture is less than 1% of our GDP reflects the need to, you know, to really look at agriculture, ag agro-industrial activities uh, in a way that we can really promote the growth of that sector. A construction a while ago was a, a, you know, a bigger piece of the economy and, and then for, for a couple of years was stagnant and now we are trying to, again, jumpstart construction. And then of course, when you look at the tourism, uh, strictly looking at uh, visitor spending is about 2% of our GDP. When you combine other subsectors associated with, with tourism, the visitor's economy, it is uh, close to you know, 7 uh, to 8% of the economy. And that also shows that there's tremendous growth in that, in that sector in particular. Um, so in, in a nutshell, we need to keep pushing and supporting uh, industries like manufacturing, specifically in the areas that we believe we can compete like bioscience and aerospace, for example, and the food industry. But we also need to look at sectors and emerging sectors that can also contribute to diversify the economy of Puerto Rico. This is always one of my, you know, the, my favorite slides uh, of any presentation because it showcases the message that Puerto Rico, again, some people believe that 
50%, 60%, 80% of the economy is related to tourism. And, and the truth is that it's the opposite. And again, we want to support tourism. Pro tourism is a very important sector for us. Should be in the double digits. It should be, you know, uh, compared to other compatible uh, competitors and jurisdictions. But the fact is that, again, you know, we are an island in the Caribbean that are, is part of the U.S. that is highly sophisticated when it comes down to the economy. And you look at the profile of the companies that are doing business in Puerto Rico. We have multinationals uh, that are doing, and, and Fortune 500 companies that are doing business in Puerto Rico. And this is not new. You know, this, is, this has been uh, a, for a long time, in many cases, decades of long-term long -term, uh, partnerships with some of these companies. Uh, and these are high paying jobs. And, and many of these companies are invest in Puerto Rico in terms of the latest technology, latest processes, um, invest in the development of talent, uh, the technology transfer, the latest products and so forth. So Puerto Rico is always, for the most part, at the, in the front pack when it comes down to, you know, to be exposed to highly regulated processes and, and state of the art technology. Now, from the public policy standpoint, for me, it's very simple to, to summarize in, in, in this slide. We need to continue moving forward in terms of being competitive to attract investment. We need to support local companies uh, to export uh, goods and services in, 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 in niche markets and in a competitive manner. We also need to attract companies to use Puerto Rico as a platform for exports. We need to boost investment in technology and innovation, both in the public and private sectors. We need to also improve the ease on doing business in the island. We need to support the attraction of new businesses retain the businesses that we have, and also support the growth of local companies uh, and, and, and small and medium enterprises. Um, looking at the strategic sectors, um, from the get-go, since we've been in this job, you know, uh, early 2017, um, we look at nine strategic sectors. And looking at those strategic sectors, how can we impact our GDP growth in a sustainable manner and we're looking at specifically boosting a private investment and also boosting exports. Those nine sectors that you can see there from agri-industrial, agri uh, agricultural industries, advanced manufacturing, aerospace technology, creative economy, the ocean economy, the bioeconomy, export services, and the visitors economy, all of those have a common denominator, is that we need to invest in competitiveness in innovation and the development of our youth and workforce program. And, and that is basically uh, our strategic plan that unites all of the initiatives, all of, all of the strategies and taxes and the, pro and the projects that we've been trying to uh, develop and implement over the course of the last three and a half years. One key component in, in, in achieving those goals, it's a, a, a piece of legislation that it's known as the New Puerto Rico Incentives Code is Act 16 of 2019. And with this, what we're trying to achieve is to put in one place, in one piece of the legislation, a, a, a rationalized approach of the major incentives that the Puerto Rico, the government of Puerto Rico offers for the specific sectors and the strategic sectors that we believe are important to um, uh, achieve the, the goals associated with economic development. So you can see that in this uh, code, uh, we have basically harmonized incentives that are associated for individuals, for example, medical professionals, uh, for, for youth, uh, young entrepreneurs. Uh, it also includes attracting individual investors. Uh, and also we've been adding other, other types of, of incentives uh, from other laws, like for example, uh, attracting researchers and so forth. We have a, a section specifically for exports, finance in, and, in, and insurance services, the visitor's economy, manufacturing, infrastructure and green energy, agriculture, creative industries, entrepreneurship, opportunity zones, of course, you know, uh, after the tax reform at the U.S. level and this new program, you know, to boost uh, growth in, in distressed areas, we are moving forward, forward with our own program incentives for opportunity zones and then other incentives uh, that might apply. And certainly the idea is to be agile, to have a simple way and a transparent way to promote economic development through incentives based on these sectors. And we are in the middle of implementing this, this important project. Uh, and as you can see, one of the things that we did is to basically standardize the different benefits 
from the standpoint of tax incentives. So for the most part, and to the extent possible, basically all the activities are going to be ruled by this standardization. You know, we offer a, a, a flat income tax rate of 4% for the most part, uh, 0% in terms of distribution of dividends, 75% exemption on property tax, 75% exemption on construction taxes, 50% exemption on municipal patent, uh, and so forth. And the idea is that we also standardize the, the mechanism and, and the legal way that we offer this tax uh, incentives through what we know, we, we know as tax decrees. And you can get a tax decree for 15 years and it could be renegotiated for an additional 15 years. So this provides the certainty that a, an individual or a business needs to promote investment or to achieve the activities that we're looking for. We are also developing new incentives through this uh, a new code. For example, we are in the process of putting the regulation for a new incentive known as hard to recruit a talent incentive. This is very novel. This is something you know, pretty new. And the idea is that we, in addition to providing an incentive to uh, a business or to an individual investor, we want to also provide an incentive to the specific employee that it will be very hard to attract to Puerto Rico. And this is something that is going to be some sort of a groundbreaking approach. And we hope to get the regulations fully approved and operational within the next three months. Uh, there are, of course, other types of, of specific tax incentives if you are a small and medium enterprise or whether you're locating uh, your business uh, uh, under the eligible activities uh, in the municipal islands of Vieques and Culebra, okay? Um, of course, you know, when you look at the outdoor industry, uh, we can highlight a couple of, of, of you know, of incentives program that we offer. Uh, one of them could be the export of services. Puerto Rico could be a hub, and we believe that we're becoming this hub for different services that can be exported from Puerto Rico to anywhere in the world, including the Caribbean, including Latin, including the United States. And we can actually specialize in number of different services associated with you know, visitors economy and of course uh, the outdoor industry. In addition to that, uh, the visitors economy section of the code offers uh, the incentives associated with developing uh, the infrastructure and, and developing of course uh, anything associated with the tourism as a sector and the segments of the tourism sector. When it comes down to hotels, when it comes down, com comes down to different developments. Also, we're talking about a, a, um, parks and, and related, uh, related facilities, administration of natural resources. And then most recently, when we put together the code, we included esports and fantasy leagues because now we are implementing a new law that legalizes uh, the uh, online sports betting in Puerto Rico and also includes uh, sports bet uh, betting, online betting associated with esports and fantasy leagues. So all of this just opens up new, new opportunities uh, in Puerto Rico. In, the, in, the term, in terms of manufacturing, like I said, the code offers alongside with the tax, the tax incentives that I just mentioned uh, for all types of manufacturing, but also for uh, industrial development, uh, research, uh, and, and scientific development, uh, aquaculture, recycling, development of, of software programs, the video game industry, all of these uh, R&D you know, innovation are included in the section of, of manufacturing of the code. And, and it does offer a competitive advantage to promote those kinds of activities in the island. In addition to the tax incentives, we also offer cash grants uh, in terms of job creation and job retention, investment in machine learning equipment, among others. And also there are some important tax credits related, for example, to R&D, which is a, one of the most attractive R&D credits uh, actually in the world. And also we promote, you know, linking local activities through the tax credit of purchasing local products manufacturing in Puerto Rico. When we look at the visitor's economy, prior to COVID-19, it was really a, a, a putting great numbers and the performance was really good even after Maria. You know, two years after Maria in 2017, the hurricanes, you know, we actually were looking at major investments in the visitor's economy section uh, of the economy, as you can see there, you know, in, from the hotels perspective, new businesses and services, and then that coupled with a key investments associated in the manufacturing sector, seeing more entrepreneurs 
getting into technology, you know, creating startups associated with, with uh, sophisticated services, manufacturing, uh, the tourism sector. Things were in the right direction prior to COVID-19. Of course, COVID-19 changed the whole landscape. And now we are in the process of, of regrouping ourselves and, and, and trying to jumpstart the economy, especially in those in these sectors, um, now that we are also reopening the economy as a whole. Uh, I mentioned before uh, two um, organizations. One, uh, there are nonprofit, private led. One of them is Invest Puerto Rico. Uh, it was created by law in 2017. And Invest Puerto Rico now is, is in charge of promoting the island to bring new business and new investment from abroad uh, and also promote and market the island as an investment destination. Uh, by the same token, uh, by law, we created uh, our own destination marketing organization known as Discover Puerto Rico. And Discover Puerto Rico is now in charge of marketing the island as a world-class tourism and visitors economy destination. We are putting a lot of faith and effort and support uh, for the sustainable development of these two organizations are very important for Puerto Rico, not only for the short term, but specifically for the prospects of growth in the medium and long term. Alongside with you know, partners like the Science Trust, uh, these are key organizations that are gonna help Puerto Rico to navigate through and towards the positive um, economic growth. When it comes down to specifically uh, the outdoors, uh, outdoor recreational activities, Puerto Rico has been known uh, to promote some of this uh, in one way or another in different shapes and forms, as you can see here in the slide. The way we see it is that we need to link these activities from the perspective of the visitor's economy and the tourism uh, economy, but also from the business opportunity perspective. Uh, and as long as we can promote and, and, and we can incentivize uh, the demand for this type of activities, not only from the service standpoint, but also from the product standpoint, uh, from local domestic demand, from also from abroad uh, demand. Altogether, I think that Puerto Rico could be a place that coupled with the right approach of incentives, coupled with the ease of doing business and other things that we're trying to do to, for Puerto Rico to be competitive, certainly we can also spur the growth of local startups or even attract companies to Puerto Rico that can somehow uh, link a, the needs of products and services associated with outdoor uh, recreational activities, such as the one that you can see here and also in the next slide. And, and Puerto Rico, of course, have many competitive advantages that we can uh, certainly achieve this goal, not necessarily in a long-term approach, but something that can be done also on the short and medium term. Uh, almost finalizing uh, my presentation, um, we also very, very uh, active and engaged in, in, in moving forward with key projects along a, an, you know, 100 by 35, you know, across the board in Puerto Rico. Uh, we're talking about medical tourism projects. We're talking about infrastructure projects like the Puerto Ponce. We're talking about the redevelopment of, of, of the old naval base, Roosevelt Roads, a film district. We're talking about a new ocean technology park. There's uh, a number of things that we are trying to, uh, to promote and we've been very busy for the last couple of years. And some of these projects are more advanced than others. But the point here is that there is a vision in terms of looking for very uh, important projects uh, across the island that are going to help us to move forward with the objectives that I just mentioned before. One of them, of course, is the Roosevelt Roads Old Naval Base. And for the last through maybe three years, we changed a little bit the approach uh, of, of this uh, development. And instead of looking for a master developer, we look at looking at specific projects that can gain the critical mass in order to at some point attract a master developer. And I think that we have done a reasonably good job in terms of looking at these projects. Uh, as you can see here, this is the master plan for the redevelopment of the waterfront of, uh, of Roosevelt Roads. Uh, there are some projects right now uh, within you know, this master plan that are either in the planning phase or moving towards the construction phase. Uh, we are also finalizing a microgrid within Roosevelt Road so we can offer competitive, uh, high quality, uh, sustainable, resilient energy uh, in, in Roosevelt Road. We're also uh, close to announce a huge major um, tourism related project in Roosevelt Road. So things are, even with the challenges of COVID-19 and others, uh, I think we're still moving forward with some of the things. And of course, you know, when you look at the outdoor recreational 
a potential, Roosevelt Road certainly uh, has a good fit into that. So finalizing my presentation, um, I think that Puerto Rico, if you can summarize what has happened of the last, not only three and a half years, you know, with the hurricanes, you know, with the political unrest, with the situation of the earthquakes, now COVID-19, and prior to that, we were going through different fiscal and economic challenges. But the fact is that even with those challenges, Puerto Rico is still a great place, you know, to invest. And opportunities overwhelm those, those challenges. And we have the tools. I think we have the will. I think we have, you know, the relationship with the private sector. I think we have institutions all together uh, that can really potentiate uh, maximizing, maximizing and capitalizing these unprecedented investment opportunities in the key sectors that you can see in this slide. So we need to keep our optimism high. We need to also be hopeful because Puerto Rico, even with the challenges, I think that Puerto Rico can go and become you know, a great place you know, to live, to visit, to invest, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, the outdoor industry uh, has to be part of that equation and part of that strategy. So as, as my final uh, part of my presentation, I'm gonna show you a video that was shared by Discover Puerto Rico. And I think it does highlight some of the things that I just you know, discussed and some of the things that have been discussed so far. So let me just look at here. Here we go. Let me see if I can. All right. So uh, I hope that you find the video, you know, uh, you know, actually it's pretty good. Uh, it conveys a great message. And I want to thank, you know, the people, the, the you know, great folks from Discover Puerto Rico, specifically Brad Dean he has done an amazing job uh, leading, you know, Discover Puerto Rico and, and the great performance of the tourism industry prior to COVID-19. So, and hopefully, you know, the presentation was uh, productive and conveyed, you know, the right message towards the audience associated with the outdoor industry potential. So thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary. Um, so with that, I think there's a lot of questions from, from everyone in the forum. So we want to open the floor to, to some questions. But um, first, I wanted to, to ask some questions to Pitt um, that, are, that are related to the topic that the Secretary was just discussing. Um, uh, first of all, Pitt, I would like to know what, what percentage of Utah's GDP uh, does uh, outdoor industry represent? And, and I know there's a mix um, as far as companies that manufacture it, also the effect that it has on companies that decide to move their headquarters to Utah because of the access to, to the outdoor activities. Um, could you give us a, an idea of, of how that is divided and, and, and what percentage it represents, please? Yeah, the, the, outdoor, the outdoor industry directly is about 3%, and that kind of includes tourism, you know, the effects on tourism and, and things like that. Um, so about 3.3%, I think I had in, in that slide that we had. As far as mm -hmm. directly to the uh, kind of recruitment of new business outside of the outdoor industry sectors that, you know, I don't, I don't have the number of the, of how it affects the GDP, but like I mentioned, um, we did a, we did a pretty heavy survey of, of, uh, businesses across all sectors, whether that's tech, um, healthcare, financial, all the different sectors on, on what they, you know, how they prioritize the access to outdoor recreation to, you know, kind of toting the reasons why they, why they set up shop in, in Utah and how it, they use it to recruit talent and employees to the state. Um, like I said, 30, I think it was about 32% of the, of the companies that we interviewed, um, 
put that as one of the number one or number two priorities for the reason of why they chose to be in Utah. Obviously, the other ones are, uh, uh, you know, business friendly policies and, you know, kind of like the secretary mentioned, all the programs that they're establishing to, to incentivize businesses to be there. You know, basically with those two things, um, that is what's helped the state of Utah be really successful. The, the, the business friendly side of things and policies and incentives, but on top of that, the way that we can, t we can really hang our hats on and, and throw a banner of quality of life because of access to outdoor recreation, that that's like the one, two punch to get companies yeah. to be here for sure. Those are the two things. Kind of like the, the work life balance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They, you know, again, for the, for the bottom line of the business, the, the, the incentives are what they want to see, but sure. for the overall quality of life of their employees and retaining employees, you know, a close second. And that's the, the outdoor recreation and the, and the access to that, that really, it really benefits. So. And, and out, out of the, the, the global manufacturing or, or HQs for some of these companies, like you were mentioning before, Black Diamond, Petzl and, and some of these others that, that are in Utah, how many have decided to make their homes Utah due to the, the incentives or since you, since, since Utah decided to take this focus on the outdoor economy? Yeah. Like what's what? Yeah. We, we see, you know, we see a couple of companies a year, um, you know, considering and moving, moving shops to it. I, 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 just off the top of my head, I don't know the exact number, but you know, as far as international companies in that are outdoor industry based, that have set up shop here. You know, we have we have um, probably close to 25 to 30 businesses that have set up their North American distribution here or a, a U.S. distribution. So you know that includes that includes bike companies within the United States that maybe have their head offices in California or in or maybe in Canada or, or something like that. But put a distribution center here because of. Um, the incentives behind it, as well as, you know, keeping, keeping staff happy and, and everything else. So um, on top of that, though, we see a huge increase outside of the outdoor industry with very large companies, um, you know, um, Procter Gamble, uh, Northrop Grumman, you know, really large industry names that are establishing shops in rural Utah and establishing locations in, in outside of Salt Lake City, but in Utah because of the incentives and also, again, the quality of life for those employees and the cost of cost of living also helps, right? You know, it's affordable. Sure. It's, it's way better than setting up a shop in California, which is way more expensive and, and things like that. So, you know, we see a lot of companies outside of, you know, large companies outside of the outdoor industry sector that decide to open offices or, or shops here for those reasons so yes um and this question is is directed to both uh, you Pitt and andrew um if if um if our local government or or the the economic development uh, office would decide to to consult with um with utah as as a means to get guidance on how to to move this forward as as you know starting from the ground up and understanding that the resources are limited. What are, what are two, two to three steps that, that you think we should focus at first in order to be able to gradually uh, start integrating the, the outdoor industry as part of the economy, not just from, from a tourism aspect, but also from a man, manufacturing and also growing the other sectors that are related to, to the outdoor industry. Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then Andrew can, Andrew can add to what I'm saying. I think, you know, the first, the first steps really, and, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is finding the, finding the funding to support the outdoor industry, right? And that's, that's the tricky part, you know. It, but you can get a lot of increase and, 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 and funding available from many different sectors. We, again, because the manufacturing sector may, may benefit from it. The tourism industry may benefit from it. So, you know, it's kind of a, a conglomeration of pulling together many industries to support a, an office of outdoor recreation. Um, so I think, I think that's key. Uh, you know, Utah definitely had an uphill battle in, 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 in doing it. Uh, they, at first, there was a lot of skeptical leaders in the state that didn't see the value in it. Um, luckily, we had a couple that 
with with really great influence so i think that's also you know i think that's also key finding finding the leaders within puerto rico whether that's business leaders whether that's lawmakers you know whatever it is finding finding those right people to to be the 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 voice and the the people behind you know the the advocates for the outdoor industry um with, luckily we have a lot of very prominent business leaders in the industry and outside of the industry and other sectors that love outdoor recreation. You know, that, again, that's the reason they're here and they love to ride their bikes after work. They love to take their families camping. They love to, you know, and I'm sure Puerto Rico has the same, right? You have probably have prominent business leaders that are there just for the reasons of, of access to the surf and the beach and, and, and uh, you know, the mountains and, and, and the canyons and everything else that they have, you know, the beauty of, of Puerto Rico um, and getting those business leaders on board to support, you know, kind of a movement of, of creating an office and, and, and showing that, hey, that's the reason we're here. And that's the reason why we bring business here. And that really helps. Um, so, you know, it's, it takes a, it takes a bit, but forming those relationships is, is really important because those are the people that are going to help to to move the creation of an office forward. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, part of that manufacturing side of things uh, becomes really important. Um, kind of taking a look at what you currently manufacture and are there ways to integrate in some of these other products. So one of our big manufacturers here in the state, Lifetime, uh, started off manufacturing a lot of basketball hoops, backboards. Uh, they got into a lot of plastics. Uh, manufacturing and then uh, turned the corner and said, hey, we've got these this equipment. Why don't we try making uh, kayaks? And so now they're one of the biggest kayak manufacturers um, pumping out kayaks. And they're just like, we wouldn't have really thought, but, you know, a couple of people asked us, you know, outdoors, I like to go kayaking. Why not try it? And, um, and now they're just putting on a massive cooler line. Uh, or, you know, taking to the beach or taking camping. And so it's kind of understanding, that's why I say looking at some of that textile manufacturing and talking to some of the, the businesses that uh, could really benefit um, from having more of a local textile manufacturer. I know here in the state of Utah, Browning, and I know you do a lot of uh, tactical with military uniforms and things like that. And, so you kind of already have this tactical expertise that maybe a company like Browning might shift some manufacturing that way. Um, and some more of these brands that have more of a tactical feel is, is where you start and then you move that way. But kind of looking at that manufacturing sector, uh, where do we want to expand it? So what companies do we maybe need to start talking with uh, about the benefits, the tax incentives, those things to relocate? Sure. Um, especially right now where the climate is kind of, well, maybe we need to take a second look at where we manufacture and pull from our Asian facilities and maybe we, we relocate it here. And so looking at kind of what manufacturing to start with and then uh, starting to court some of those companies. And then at the same time, looking at your educational um, universities and schools, whether that's in the you know, high schools all the way up through university and are we training uh, these students to be able to come get these really good jobs? Uh, you know, whether it's the outdoor industry, whether it's aerospace, biomedical, like are we making sure that we've got a good pipeline of talent? Because um, a lot of our, our students too, uh, just to give you an example, uh, we're very heavy in some of the textiles. pattern, And uh, one of the biomedical companies here in the Valley uh, turned to us and said, hey, we've got, this need to sew up these knee braces. Uh, we got a lot of design work, but all of our mechanical engineers don't know anything about textiles because they're traditionally trained in metals, hard plastics, yeah. composites. And so they took one of our outdoor design products, brought them in as basically a biomedical engineer to design all the soft products. And so for wow. the last few years, he's been designing knee braces, back braces, all this kind of stuff based on the training that he got and so that's why I say that the education, even though you might train them specifically for outdoor, you might find that there's even a niche to move them into some of that biomedical um, or some of the aerospace or other, other elements that, that you have. So by training that workforce and making that investment in the university system, 
uh, helps improve the manufacturing and helps improve some of the design. And then even then, but like I said, potentially some spin out companies that could help build that outdoor segment. I had to excuse awesome. myself. Um, I have another commitment. Um, and, uh, you know, it was real, real pleasure, you know, listening to, you know, to the other speakers, uh, you know, folks from Utah. I was there, you know, I think a year or two years ago, a beautiful state, you know, incredible things happening over there. So uh, looking forward to having, you know, uh, future conversations with you guys. Okay. All right. Thank you, Secretary. Have a great Thank day. you, Secretary. Thank you. So we're close to running out of time as well. So I think um, let's let's open the floor to one or two questions, and then the rest we will respond via via email if that's okay. So okay. Carlos, um, if you want to open it to take one or two questions, and that way, and Carlos, the least also, if you have any comments as well that you would like to add, please, um, from from the DMO side. Sure. Um, real quickly, I think Secretary Lavoy already summed it up very nicely. Um, by his last, uh, with his last video that he showed, uh, possibilities are endless here when it comes to outdoor recreation. And thanks to our year-round climate, you can pretty much do any of any of, uh, any of those sports uh, here. So, in, in in regards to our specific uh, task that we are uh, putting. So marketing and promoting the island, it's, it's what we are uh, here to do in this year. And uh, as you can see, the, the outdoor recreation present, represents a huge opportunity of growth for Puerto Rico. Uh, now, with my current role and, and, and on, on the sales side, we are we're in charge of pretty much capturing organized events, sporting events, where you can track the data on who's visiting and, and the, the tendencies and when they're able to come back. And besides a few surfing tournaments and, and or regattas that we have here, and also races uh, like triathlons and all that, and maybe a, a question for, for Peter and Andrew, how, how is, this, is the state of Utah capturing the data from individual travelers that are, already visiting, that are only visiting uh, your uh, outdoor spaces for that specific reason, um, both maybe locally and, and or out of state? Because that will definitely help in the, in when it comes to the the funding part, and which always represents uh, a problem. And and as you know, your where you get a lot of your incentives through the hotel tax, we do as well. So that's something maybe that can can help when the conversation starts in order to put some money into redeveloping our trails, our coastal areas, and and all of that. Yeah, we rely really we we rely really heavily on our DMOs in the state. So at each county, you know, we have 27, 28 counties in the state, right? That that each have basically a DMO or a, a domestic, uh, sorry, a destination marketing officer there that um, is able to give us and collect that data for you know who's visiting their county, who is doing what there, what activities are people using. We also rely very heavily on, um, you know, information from our state parks and from our national park partners, even though they're federal agencies, we rely heavily on, on that information as well to see, again, what people are doing in certain areas of the state, what type of activities they're, they're engaging in and, and everything else. So um, I know there has been talks of, of uh, you know, how do we better track this, whether that's with apps and providing a state specific app to track activity to website usage and, and searches and, and everything else. Um, none of that is, is really implemented yet in the state of Utah, but there is, you know, pretty big projects on moving forward with that. Because again, like you say, collecting that data just gives you that much more sway and information in, in getting funding to getting support from, from leadership and to get, you know, help grow the, the, the economy, whether it's the tourism economy or the outdoor, outdoor recreation and outdoor industry. So, um, yeah, I think, I think talking to, to local community leaders, and I don't know how, you know, tourism is divided up in Puerto Rico. Like I said, we have a great network of DMOs. I'm sure you have people all over the Island in different areas that do it. Um, one of the initiatives that, that the state of Utah tourism, and I'll just bring this up real quick, uh, has, has tried is we saw a very large increase and very big success with visitors coming for national parks in a campaign that was done 
you know, five, six years ago about visiting our national parks. We call them the mighty five. Um, tons of, tons of great uh, exposure there and tons of great visitorship. Now the focus is how do we do this sustainably and get really high quality visitors. So I like, you know, the idea of, of you mentioning, you know, events and things like that. That's kind of a shift in focus for our tourism office is, is called the Red Emerald Initiative. And it's to bring kind of long term, high quality, uh, I guess, you know, more, more invested visitors to the state, people that will come and spend more than just a weekend, because we get a lot of that, right? People that drive in for a three-day weekend to visit a national park and, and then leave the state. How do we get people to stay, maybe invest in a piece of property here or invest in, in, in the community a little bit and get to know the community? Events are, are one of those things. We have very big bike race here in Utah. We have some very big trail running sure. and, and everything else. And, and, and that helps to bring community, you know, bring a little bit more interaction with the community to the visitors and not just having visitors come in and out of, out of the towns and, and, and visit. So, um, and that, you know, those events help to also collect data on, on who's visiting or there. Cause again, it just engages the community a little bit more with it. So we get a little more information on, on who the visitors are and where they're coming from. Is your, is your office mainly in charge of uh, providing those permits for those events in your parks? Um, no, they, that's usually done through land management agencies. So if it's, if the event takes place on forest service land, it's the national forest service that does it. If it's the park service, our, our tourism department is strictly the marketing behind that basically. So they do the marketing, whether that's ski resort, you know, they help with ski resort marketing, ski, ski visitors. They also help with, um, you know, national park visitorship and everything else. But, uh, yeah, mostly mostly they um, are just the marketing of that. And Carlos, I'm happy to connect you with our, with our tourism office. They're a sister office with us. The tourism office also lives under the Office of Economic Development here in the state of Utah. And we, I, I, I work very closely with them and, and you know, ha ha happy to connect you or anybody in Puerto Rico that wants to ask questions you know, to, to them. Um, they're, they're happy to help as well. Yeah, that, that, would, be, that would be a great, a great um, Effort. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, so we have three questions that we're going to take. The first one is from Soledad. I was just wondering if, I mean, at least here in Puerto Rico, especially related to ecotourism and small outfitters and, and you know, tour guides or, or people who take um, folks to do different um, outdoor recreation activities, um, have a lot of problems in terms of the costs of insurance premiums because they consider it high-risk activities. I know a lot of them that either don't have insurance premiums and just risk it uh, or have been forced to close because they cannot pay for it. Uh, I don't know if that's been something that you faced in Utah and I'd be curious to know, um, you know, if there's been some solution to that. Yeah, unfortunately we do face that, you know, that, that is a, that is a major issue in Utah. I, I personally haven't, haven't dealt with anybody since I've been in this position directly, but I, I have heard, some history about it um it and i don't have a solution <laughs> for you unfortunately it's a it's a tough thing you know there's liability some of these organizations um a lot of guide organizations specifically like fishing um fishing guides where a lot of them are just individuals doing things they they work together to form an association within the state which maybe helps get them a little bit more leverage in that and and paying dues into that, that, that then can get some liability insurance through that, which their dues would be less than establishing their own insurance plan. You know, there, there's been solutions that have come up, but you know, a lot of it comes with, with forming associations and forming groups that they can, they can, you know, it's an additional cost for them, but it's, it's a less of a cost than paying for insurance themselves. So um, right now that's kind of the, the best solution that I think guides and outfitters have come up with the state, but, um, you know, it, it, that's a tough situation for sure. Yeah, it's something that we're, we're working on here as well to, to try to get a group policy and, and figure out a way to, to make that work as well. It's, it's an, uphill, an uphill battle for sure. Um, uh, Francisco, I think you had a, a question for, for Andrew, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so uh, the case of Puerto Rico and uh, 
first I wanted to thank the organizers of the of the forum is that uh, we have different uh, activities that pertain or are managed by different government agencies or different interest groups. And I wanted to know if in the case of you, that how did you manage to be, to convince all those different uh, stakeholders to, to um, work toward a common goal of developing the outdoor recreation industry? So that's basically my question. How, how were you able to steer all of them into a different common goal, especially due to the fact that it's hard for agencies to speak the same language when we are talking about government? Yeah. So I think a lot of it has to do with um, first kind of helping everyone understand what the common goal is and how everyone's interconnected. Because really, if you if you tend to only focus on one element, uh, you may only draw those people. It's like trying to pick a restaurant, right? Uh, you you have your favorite restaurant, your wife or your kids have their favorite restaurant, your friends have. And so sometimes it becomes very hard to, you know, have a common goal of which restaurant you want to go to. But if there's multiple options in the same area, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit easier. Um, so kind of the same thing where by not just focusing on only climbing or only skiing, but focusing on all the different elements of the outdoor industry in the state of Utah. And uh, then taking that and helping each industry understand how um, they're kind of interconnected and how, yeah, you might be on the ski patrol uh, during the winter, but then in the summer, all of a sudden now it's mountain biking, which didn't exist 20, well, I guess about 30 years ago the ability to then put your bike on the back of a ski lift and take it up to the top of the mountain and ride down. Um, and so helping the bike industry understand why they are why they need to be closely tied together with the ski industry or helping uh, in those regards. And so it's kind of the same, even just um, as we were trying to put together our university program, helping all the industries understand why uh, this program was necessary and why and how it would benefit uh, those different brands. And so now that we've had graduates, we have them go, like I said, they're going to some of the clothing brands. They're going to some of the uh, soft goods gear brands. Uh, some of them are going more into the hard product brands. Um, but in the end now, a lot of the businesses are, are realizing, oh yeah, I really do stand to benefit from these graduates of your program. Uh, and likewise, I think the outdoor industry here in the state of Utah, um, it just took time getting them to understand how they could be tied together. Because um, I know just even in Puerto Rico, you can be rock climbing one minute on the beach, surfing, you know, 20 minutes later. And, and so helping them understand how that might uh, influence people who are tourists looking to come and enjoy those industries. And and things like that. So I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of a fight really helping everyone just understand. But once everyone understands how they're really all interconnected, then you can kind of get that force behind you and start pushing for, for that main goal of growing the industry. And I think we have one more question from uh, Giovanni Paoli. And with that, we'll wrap up. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just curious about uh, a, I guess you kind of mentioned it a little bit now, Andrew, but uh, more for the state organization. In support of individual providers, I imagine uh, that outdoor recreation is just large, so huge, so you must somehow market it, right, uh, to uh, all consumers. And it, how do you go about that part of, of promoting all the outdoor leisure recreation uh, opportunities, but more so, the individuals, uh, providers in, in each of the particular areas, I mean, it, that must be a, a very big uh, endeavor. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you, that, that is an understatement. It is a very big endeavor to represent all of the outdoor recreation in the state. So just to give you an idea, right, skiing is probably, skiing and the skiing industry is probably one of the biggest outdoor recreation drivers in the state of Utah. We, we see so many visitors of skiing. A close second to that is hunt and fish. Um, market uh, and and then right behind that mountain biking is, has been just bo booming in, in popularity trickle it down we get so many more other activities whether that's um, climbing and canyoneering and 
OHV riding uh, and ATV riding motorcycles, all of that, you know, we have, we have a pretty big demographic to, to represent. And uh, kind of as Andrew uh, mentioned, just talking, right, that they don't, they're not always all on the same page as, the, as far as the way land should be used or the way that we should recreate or who's more important than, than who. And so it, 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 does, it does require some, some uh, tiptoeing a little bit, I guess, and some careful, careful steps. Um, our organization from a state doesn't promote, we don't do the active promotion or marketing of any of these activities. That, that is the tourism office's role. Um, that is the brand's role in how they do it as well. The, you know, with the companies, you know, whether it's a big climbing company in the state or a big fishing company in the state, they are the ones responsible for kind of encouraging and, and marketing that. But we want to represent them and give equal uh, opportunity and equal, equal representation in front of, in front of state leaders for those, for those activity groups. So one of the ways that we do that is because of the, the rich, uh, you know, economy is as far as of many different types of businesses we have here, we have an advisory committee that we rely really heavily on. So my office uh, you know, as the director of the office, I have three people that manage programs under me, and that's managing the grant program or managing our events and, and, and community outreach as well. Um, but with just four of us in the office, it's, it's hard to get everything done. We rely heavily on our advisory committee and our partnerships there. So our advisory committee, we have anywhere from, anywhere from 20 to 30 people that sit on that and what they do they are all representatives of many different aspects, whether that's the user groups. So they represent a certain type of activity or business or nonprofit. Um, they represent that as well. So we get that voice of, of, you know, people that represent diversity in the outdoors to people that represent manufacturing in the outdoor, in the outdoor industry. And we try to bring them all in and meet with them on a regular basis to, to get the feedback and, and representation and hear what's going on in each of those. Because, it, it is something to tackle, right? Like for Puerto Rico, it would be really hard to be talking to, to the, uh, um, you know, for example, the climbers and canyoneers the same way you talk to the surfers, right? It's just that they're, they're different. They're different groups. They're different, they're different industries, really. And, you know, how do you get representation from all of them to make sure that, that it's being equally spoken about to, to, this, to the state or the, yeah. the territory leaders? So... Um, uh, you know, I think relying on partnerships again, and this is where it's really key when you pull in the industry to rely on them. We rely really heavily on, on the businesses that have set up shop here to, to be that, um, voice for us and, and to also give us information back that we need to help make the best decisions. So, you know, those partnerships and that those advisory committees are really key. Thank you so much, Pitt. Um, with that, guys, uh, we, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for, for everyone um, that has stayed an extra half hour. Um, this was a, a great, great topic that, that everyone's very excited about. Um, we saw different, different perspectives from, from the folks in Utah. Uh, we saw some of the perspectives from, from Secretary Laboy and, and what the government is doing from a, more, more than anything from an incentive standpoint. Um, now it's a matter of, of us in the industry showing what we can do uh, uh, for the economy and keep this growing and, and get more, more support from them as well. Um, so with that, I don't know if there's any closing thoughts from, from you, Pitt and Andrew, um, and we can, we can close yeah, the meeting for today. Yeah, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. And please, like I said, anybody on this call or anybody, feel free to reach out to our office. You can you can just Google the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation and find contact information for me or, or the grant program or anything like that. We're happy to answer any questions, happy to make any connections for you to other people in Utah that may be able to help move your, your agendas forward and, and get things going. We really want to support Puerto Rico and, and getting an office uh, established and, and become part of this learning network that we have. And on top of that, if anybody needs anything from Utah, I'm always happy to visit Puerto Rico and uh, come recreate with some of you there and, and, and get, out, get out in the ocean and get out in the jungle and, and, and have some fun. So thank you again for the opportunity. This, is, this has been great. Thank you. Yeah, and I was just going to say thanks again for uh, having us on. And 
Uh, it's always a pleasure to head out there. Like I said, I was trying to get out there this summer, but everything's <laughs> a little shut down. But uh, yeah, if it comes to anything at the university level, uh, working on grants, anything like that, that uh, I can be a help with, that'd be great. Um, and then in the manufacturing sector, if, if there's uh, areas of interest that maybe we could start looking at some of our Utah based companies, like I said, that are outsourcing a lot of stuff to Asia right now, um, that might be a good fit to try to at least take a, take a second look at manufacturing in Puerto Rico instead. I'm happy to make those connections with some of those brands. So, uh, like I said, just reach out, uh, and we're happy to help. So. Awesome. Thanks again. And, uh, thanks for, to, to Carlos Deliz for joining us and, and also, uh, to Dean Carlos Betancourt for joining us and, and always supporting us, uh, like you've done for the, for the past year and a half. Um, thanks again to everyone for joining the, the webinar today. We hope you enjoyed it and that the content was of, uh, a, of insight and, and learning as we always like to make the content and uh, let's all keep working together to to make this industry grow in Puerto Rico where we know there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of talent and, uh, and a bright future for us. So thanks everyone again and, and let's keep moving forward. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.